Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is what I find very interesting one on the book of Psalms in the Bible. This is lesson number nine in that series from March 2 of 2024, entitled, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, help us to understand and comprehend better than we have before what it means that this marvelous being, the one who was a prince of heaven, the God of heaven, decided to come down and become a human being. And all the preparation that you went through to try to help us see what was coming and how poorly we did at doing that. Help us not to make that mistake again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've had any questions about the inspiration of the Bible, and this lesson should convince you that God was active from the beginning to the end. The psalm represents the future life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ so well that it is amazing. Jim? From the Bible study guide, psalms, these psalms testify about Christ's person and ministry. Almost all aspects of his work in the plan of salvation are seen in the psalms. In various ways, Christ's life and work are prefigured and predicted in them, often with remarkable accuracy. The topics revealed in the Psalms include Christ's de deity, his sonship, his obedience, his zeal for God's temple, his identity as the good shepherd, his betrayal, his suffering, his bones not to be broken, his death, resurrection, ascension, priesthood, and kingship. That's quite a list. <laughs> yeah. It's all there as predicted many centuries before Jesus came in the flesh. No wonder, for example, when talking about his ministry, Jesus pointed back to the Psalms when speaking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 44. He wanted them to find the Psalm, in the Psalms evidence for who he was. Some of the Psalms that have a typographical, typological, typological excuse me, fulfillment in Christ includes Psalms 24, 45, 72, and 10, 110, 101, excuse me. The ideal Christ and judge, as well as Psalms 88 and 102, prayers of the suffering servant of God. In the Psalms, through the psalmist laments, thanksgiving, praises, and cries for justice and deliverance, we can hear the echoes of Christ's prayer for the salvation of the world from the Bible study guide for... for okay, now I'm going to have, uh, give you a challenge. I want you to think about this as we work our way through this lesson. The, boy, the, the young boys in Israel, ancient Israel, those who had a chance to go to school, we don't know what percentage that was. Of course, it did not include Jesus. Jesus didn't go to any of the rabbinical schools. But one of the main things they did was memorize scripture. Some of them had the entire Hebrew Bible memorized in Hebrew. Paul probably really did, almost certainly did. Now, the question is, is if they had memorized the book of Psalms and they saw something happen in the life of Christ that seemed like it was something to do with something they knew about from Psalms, did they just do that and it wasn't just happenstance? Or read the Psalms written intentionally to predict what's going to happen? Now that's a, that's a tricky question, but I want you to think about it. And many places in the Psalms and also in the New Testament, we see Jesus pictured as the shepherd of his people. This was true not only of his relationship to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but also to all of his faithful followers in the times of the New Testament. Many Psalms represent this truth. Psalm 23 is one of the best known. I think some of us might have learned that sometime. Well, some of us memorized it as well. So <laughs> you want to read that for us? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. 
He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths, as he has promised. Even if I walk, go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, O Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherds, Lord, and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. Wow. <laughs> you welcome me as a honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life. And your house will be my house home as long as I live. Okay, we have pretty solid evidence that this was written by David, probably in some of his younger years. We don't know exactly when. Um, what do you suppose he was talking about when he says specifically, you prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me? No element of self-centeredness there, was there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not talking about his friends. He's talking about his enemies. What do you think he was trying to get to? It's probably written at a time when Saul was pursuing him. And wherever he went, it seemed like there was somebody trying to watch him and trying to... Re well, we know several times that enemies reported, he's at such and such a place, he's at such and such a place. That's probably what he had in mind. Yeah, it's a perfect good insight into what he thought was the, the God that he was dealing with and mm -hmm. th that thought he was a good guy and he could depend on him, I think. Yeah. An understanding of how ancient Israelite shepherds cared for their flocks and related to those flocks is a marvelous picture of how God wants to relate to us. The shepherd called his sheep and they came to him. Even, you know, I don't know how many of you, I, I lived up in northern Idaho when I was young, and uh, in some parts of Idaho, there are large, at least they were in those days, large flocks of sheep. And they would take them down to the lowlands and head in the winter, and then in the, as summer came along, they would move them up into the meadows and the mountains and so forth to feed up there. And so if you were driving around in those areas, you would come to these enormous uh, flocks of sheep and they're walking down, the, down the, the road and you have no choice but to wait and figure out if and when they let you through. But what you notice, of course, is that those, those people had two or three dogs and they kept, if any sheep got out of line, there was a dog right on them like this. That's not like this. This is, the Israelites did, this was very different. They, the guy would call them, he would walk out, and no matter, even though uh, they were, the sheep would, would sleep in a pen mixed up with all kinds of other sheep, but when that shepherd called them, they would come. Each one came to their own owner. And the shepherd slept at the gate? Well, sometimes, sometimes that probably was true. We don't know that for sure. Um, I mean, we wouldn't know a particular shepherd at what particular time. But yeah, sometimes they, they had to sleep at the gate, especially if they're worried about sheep thieves right. or in some cases, animals. animals. Some of us have had dogs that would be potentially in a group and you call them and your dog might come yeah. at that time, right, Myra? <laughs> yeah. Might come, might, yes. Might come. Yeah. This idea is clearly suggested in the New Testament in John 10, where Jesus talks about, I'm the good shepherd, and he also talks about, I'm the sheep, sheep pen. That image is carried all the way to the point where Jesus said he would die for his sheep. This image is expanded by saying that Jesus would become a sacrificial lamb to die for his people. Remember that the very best lambs, the perfect lambs, were the ones chosen to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. that, just, that just, you know, in our society, see, that seems wrong. You know, you sacrifice the ones that, you know, aren't doing too well anyway. Obviously, the symbolism is there. You but sacrifice. It had to be one year old and no blemish, no spots. It had yep. to be perfect. Yep. Psalm 22 is an amazing portrayal of many of the aspects of the life and especially the death of Jesus. Jennifer? From Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18. 
My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, let's, let's be clear. This was written by David. This would be a thousand years before Jesus. So is he talking about, a, was he talking about a prophecy about Jesus or was he talking about his personal experience? Was Jesus reciting this or did he just coincidentally say it? So that's the question I'm trying to get you to answer. Okay, go ahead. All who see me jeer at me. They stick out their tongues and shake their heads. You relied on the Lord, they say. Why doesn't he save you? If the Lord likes you, why doesn't he help you? An evil gang is round me. Like a pack of dogs, they close in on me. They tear at my hands and feet. All my bones can be seen. My enemies look at me and stare. They gamble for my clothes and divide them among themselves. Now, I mean, do you suppose that really happened to David? No. So it's a prophecy. It is a prophecy, especially, well, Jesus quoted David, uh, uh, yes, but then the guys who were jeering him, mm -hmm. they had no idea, but they were quoting exactly what David was saying. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, and not only this, if you stop and, and look at this carefully and you think about it, we are no, we, if, if you accept the writings of Ellen White and even the Bible in some places, the story of Jesus Christ's life in uh, quite a bit of detail was revealed to Enoch, it was revealed to Moses, it was revealed to Abraham, it was, re, re, I'm getting those mixed up in, uh, chronologically, relieved, uh, revealed to David. So is he talking about something that he actually had seen in vision? And Isaiah also? <clears throat> Isaiah. Yes. Okay, well, Psalms 118, verse 22, clearly points to his rejection by the Jewish leaders. And what, what does that say, Gordon? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. Now, what do we know about the history behind that? Well, two things. Jesus was rejected, but before that, the cornerstone for the temple was put aside. What do we do with this? Yeah, well. And then, then it turned out to be the most cornerstone, the most important, mm. the most important piece of the uh, structure. Yeah. Of the of the temple. It was a strange shape, and they couldn't bear it. They just left it set out there for a long time. What's what's that for? Remember, I mean. You know, we, we think the builders do a lot of amazing things today. Everything on that, every piece of that temple, and go, go look at the temple wall that right now. Those pieces fit together so precisely, you can't put a piece of paper between them. Not only that, those things were cut and shaped somewhere else and, and brought some of them. There's one that's 160 tons that's in the wall, brought from somewhere and put together and they fit perfectly. Now tell me how they did that. I think this was made in Lebanon. I, I don't know if all the stones were or not, but it's possible. Cedar. The, 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 some of the timbers came from yes, Lebanon cedar for sure. Cedar came from Lebanon. Yeah. We cannot begin to comprehend the feelings that must have gone through the mind of Jesus as he recognized that he was being rejected by his own people. This was prophesied clearly in places like Psalm 42, 88, and 102, and it would be great if we had a chance to go and look at those Psalms. Psalms 22 is a parallel, a parallel with what you just stated there. My, my people, my Elohim, why have you abandoned me? Why have you not, uh, you can make that parallel there. Let us not forget that these passages probably represent events taking place in the life experience of David himself but they are also clearly prophetic for the life of Jesus. And we've already compared some of the very obvious places. Myra? Psalms 22, one says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And Matthew 27? 27, 27 <coughs> verse 46. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out, cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, Lima Sabachthani. Yeah, I want to say it correctly. So, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? 
If you carefully read the inspired records, it is very clear that by his death, Christ was demonstrating the consequences of sin. And let's look at this. This is a very, very significant passage from Ellen White. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. Now, you know that some people who have a very legalistic understanding of, of Christianity and so forth, and all, they have sins being carried around somehow and piled on Jesus. That's not what this is trying to tell us. He was counted as a transgressor. Now, he was treated as if, as, as if he were the chief of sinners, that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. And so what does that mean? Well, you can, again, you can go back and you can look at the legalistic understanding, the, the legal, okay, he paid the price for my sins, which of course is the very popular pagan. way of looking at it. That's a pagan. Yeah, but the, the truth is that he said, okay, you have a choice. Here's what can happen to you if you choose the, to rebel against me, and here's what happens to you if you choose to follow me. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. That doesn't mean each one of us is piling our guilt. It means it's the same guilt that we have was pressing on him. The wrath of God against him, the terrible <coughs> manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity. And why does God hate sin? Is it right. takes us away from him. Well, it's self-destructive. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to put it in ter his terms, it would say it's killing his children. You know, how would you feel if, if somebody was killing your children? You know, that's, that's, I don't know how you can say it more blunt than that. Okay, Be, uh, the wrath of God against the sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. And that's so apparent in all of his work. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. It's available to all of us. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, now, without looking at what comes up next, was the Father there or the Father wasn't there? The Father was there. He was there. The Father was there and all the, and I don't know, you know, the, Many, many centuries ago, they used to argue about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know how many, but God was there. Well, probably most of the angels from heaven were there. The devil was there with all of his angels. This was, I mean, this is an all-out battle in the great controversy. Okay. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. We should, we should read that sentence several times a day and try to figure out what it means. Um, think what Jesus had already been through. I mean, the beatings in the back and he's pouring blood down his back and crown of thorns on his head and all the abuse he's been, he has withstood. But now, the most, his biggest concern now is he can't feel the presence of his father. That was more serious to him than all of those other stuff. Okay, now how do we feel when we sin? It's great silence I hear. Well, Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. Now, did Jesus know that was true? Come on, let's be clear. What does it say? He knew. When you go to the chapter, it is finished, it says... His faith, he says, he relied on the evidence heretofore given him. He, know what the, he knew what the Father told him that was going to happen. But at this point in time, he could not, he just couldn't, it just didn't seem possible. Throughout his, his, throughout his ministry, he has always referred to death as sleep. Mm -hmm. This was not going to be a sleep. Yeah. And I think that's what 
Yeah. With him was a struggle, big struggle. Because he, this was not going to be sleep. Yeah. Well, the little girl, she's sleeping, she's going to wake up. Yeah. But know? earlier on, he says, I lay down my life and I can take it up again. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. But at this point in time, he just didn't see how that could be possible. This human Jesus. Yes. Christ felt the anguish which, and this is the next incredible thing. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. When is that? End of probation. End of probation. Yeah. And at the third coming, when everybody will be gathered around the city, the righteous will be inside the city, the wicked will be outside the city, and everyone will see the coronation of Jesus. And that's all, that whole history is spelled out in Great Controversy, page 662 uh, up to 674. Um, their separation, he feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which a sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. What will sinners think as they outside the city and they see the city and they realize what's going on in there, they have some vision of what's going on there, and they realize that could have been available to them and they realize that it's too late. There's absolutely nothing more they can do. But that's going to be also the time when Philippians 2, mm -hmm. 5, 8. Yeah. yeah, every knee shall bow, yeah. including Satan. Yeah, even Satan. But we also yeah. know that all those who are outside the city eventually will choose to have been there. Yeah. We've, they, yeah. Given the choice, even at that time, they would not go into the city. It would be and if you look, torture to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you look at Great Controversy, page 542 and 543, it says, to take a sinner to heaven would be supreme torture to them. And take, just taking Satan to heaven, 670, Great Controversy 670, supreme torture. Because why, why would that be torture to them? Because their character is sin. They, they, they can't imagine having to be loving and kind all the time. Having to be, not choosing to be, they wouldn't choose to be, but having to be, it would be torture. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God, Desire of Ages 753, paragraph 1 and 2. The imagery mentioned in Psalm 22 being attached by strong bulls, roaring lions, and dogs is just a hint of what Jesus went through during those final hours. The image of even more, the image is even more impressive when we recognize that Jesus could have spoken a word and destroyed all his enemies, just one word. Instead, he prayed for them even the ones who are nailing him to the cross. I mean, this, this is just beyond belief. But this, but the suffering Messiah shepherd will eventually rise to be seated beside the throne of God in heaven and become the foundation for our salvation. Jim? Ephesians chapter two, verses 20 to 22. You too are built upon a found the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being G Christ Jesus himself. He is the one who holds the whole building together and makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. In union with him, you are you too are building, excuse me, are building being, being built, excuse me, by being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. Good news Bible. So what's Paul's image here? <coughs> God is building a perfect, beautiful edifice, a building. And each one of us has the option of symbolically being a brick or a, whatever you want to call it, a building block in that huge edifice. Wow. Okay, well, go ahead. That was the end. As we have noted above, I'm sorry, in the quotation from Ellen White, Jesus suffered the second death. That second death is what the sinners will die in the end, recognizing what they could have enjoyed in the everlasting kingdom and recognizing at the same time that they personally have separated themselves, that's Isaiah 59, verse 2, from God. 
while we recognize that the Father and the holy angels were close beside Jesus at the, on the cross, he could, he could not perceive their presence. Meanwhile, the devil was doing everything he could to convince Jesus that his death would separate him permanently from his Father. And I, I don't know how that grabs you. I mean, here's Jesus hanging on the cross. The Father is there with all the good angels, and he's restraining the good angels from saying anything to Jesus because he doesn't want it, doesn't want it. And yet the devil is talking to Jesus on the cross, trying to get him to give up and go back to heaven or whatever. I mean, how's that, how, how, I mean, it, it, it just boggles my mind to think that that was what was going on there. But that was the climactic event of great controversy between yeah. Christ and Satan as far as he was concerned. Yeah. Because we're still in it. Yeah. Young Jewish males, we mentioned this earlier, spent much of their time in school memorizing portions of Scripture. Jesus, of course, did not attend the rabbinical schools. Is it possible that he memorized the book of Psalms? Probably. Very likely. Where do you think he would have gotten that information? From his mother. And she got it as a well, female. Well, if in you look at this very carefully, if you look at the very, very carefully, what we're told is Elizabeth and Zechariah were from the Levitical strain, the Levitical line. Now we know that Mary was from the Judah line, but somehow or other, she is a cousin to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So somewhere there she has kind of some kind of priestly influence and in how she got access to things. But of course, Ellen White tells us that Jesus was instructed directly by angels and by God himself. And by Mary. Well, and by Mary. Yeah. <laughs> so she's a fairly important part of that. Why do yeah. you think it's Mary and not Joseph? Because the mothers taught the children? Well, I, I think if there's focus, they were focusing at that point in time on his very young years before he... Yeah. Is this a, a tribulical? Or I don't quite remember. Uh, Joseph was probably not in the picture for too long. Yeah. Well, what we do know is that he was there when Jesus was 12. Right. He was not there when Jesus was 30. Yes. And we don't know when it happened. what happened in right. between those 18 years. At some point he was gone. Jesus on the cross was ultimately demonstrating the truth about God's wrath. God's wrath is simply as turning away and loving uh, that should be turning away, I'm sorry, it says way, and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable, deadly, and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. As we know from the Old Testament, Satan did everything he possibly could to get the children of Israel to rebel against God's guidance. His care and his work as their shepherd um, Clearly, the human component of the, of the Davidic covenant failed. Now, that's a fancy word and whatever. What do we mean by that? When we say the human component of the Davidic covenant failed, what do we mean? Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> it means their, hand, their side of the, of the agreement, David and his descendants, they just didn't, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Even go back farther than that. From Moses, the children of Israel in the wilderness didn't do what they were supposed to do. They just failed. Okay, Charles. Colossians 1.20, through the Son then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. What, how much? <laughs> All of it. The whole universe, okay? Yes. God made peace through his son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Good news, Bible. Go ahead. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. For by the blood of Christ, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what was 
what he had purposed and made um, known to us the secret plan he had uh, already decided to complete by the means of Christ. This plan which God will complete when the time is right is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Jesus as head. Again, good news so, Bible. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. This is absolutely essential for us to understand. The plan of salvation must be big enough to include the entire universe. This is the whole, something happened, something is happening in the process of the plan of salvation that will impact the entire universe. Okay, read the next passage. There. Ephesians 3, 7 through 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I was less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking, taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. Let me interrupt for just a second. Who's taking these good news, this good news, to, good news to the Gentiles? Mr. Pharisee. Yes, Pharisee himself. <laughs> you know, not too long ago, I was at the Mars Hills, and I yeah. could just imagine this man standing there. And Mr. Pharisee himself. Yes. The, to this unknown God, let me tell you about that God, <laughs> that I wanted to destroy this nonsense, and yeah. here I am speaking to you. Yep. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, of Christ and of making all people see how how God's secret plan is to be put into into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through the past ages in order that all at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers of the powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom and uh, all its different forms. Okay, what could the angels who stand around God's throne possibly learn about God from us? That's what it says here. <laughs> well, I, to me, his love was put in the crucible, in the, in the test tube, you know, uh, because without that, they would, no one would understand what his love was all about. Well, these are some of the clearest passages in Scripture suggesting that the plan of salvation involves the entire universe. The beings throughout the universe are learning about God from us. What they're seeing is God's unbelievable forgiveness and care for rebellious people. But the sufferings and death of Jesus is not the end of the story, fortunately. As we know, he arose and returned to his position in heaven. And that's, this is spelled out in considerable detail in Psalms. We unfortunately don't have time to read all those passages. Psalms 2, 110, 89, 110 again. Um, so a number of passages, but uh, let's see. Where are we? Who's next? Jennifer. So from Psalm 2, verse 7, I will announce, says the king, what the Lord has declared. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Good news Bible. Okay. So who's talking to who here? God the Father is talking. Okay. And who's he talking to? His son. Jesus. Okay. Do we know for sure that that's Jesus? And if so, at what point? See, this is a huge theological debate. I don't know if you are aware of that, but at what point in history does God say to Jesus, you are my son? At the baptism, certainly. At the baptism, exactly. At the baptism. So what does this passage mean? When Jesus arose and ultimately returned to heaven, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. That is the side of favor. This is a new experience for the beings and the rest of the universe. Christ had given up his omnipresence and taken on his human form. So here's a human being seated at the right hand of God in heaven. 
He will maintain this link to the human family for the rest of eternity. And, and it, uh, yeah. he is going to be the way he left uh, this earth. Yeah, he will return. He's not going to change eternally. So if we're going to say we're going to be nine feet tall, we might be looking down on him some. You know, I'm I'm not saying it in a funny no, way. No, yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, he, he will. The marks are going yeah. to be always there on his hands. He will. He will be the same height I, of anybody okay. else. I'm sure. Everybody else. Right. Right. Uh, but it's just going to be equal, just like all of us. Yeah. He's going to have his human form. In ancient times, the utter defeat of an enemy is represented by the fact that the king of the conquering nation would sometimes, in the presence of a lot of other people, his soldiers, place his foot on the neck of the conquered king of the defeated nation. Mm. This is what is implied by talking about Christ conquering and making his enemies into a footstool. Any questions about that? And what is Christ doing now in the heavenly sanctuary? Because this there's still the story is going on. It's not the great controversy is not over yet. While this is not the main focus of this lesson, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, and Daniel 7, 9 to 27 make it very clear that Christ rises to take on his role as the king of the universe. He does that through the, his priestly ministry as represented in Zechariah 3, refuting Satan's claims against his faithful people. So what, the main job of Jesus of Jesus in heaven now is refuting all of Satan's arguments, his claims, everything. Just against us, primarily, but against God, I mean, is the main thing. All the accusations that Satan has brought over the generations against God, Jesus is there to refute all those accusations. It's important to notice in this context that it is not the Father who is accusing his faithful people. It is Satan. Those accusations of Satan are answered by Christ. One further representation in this lesson that we need to notice is found in Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord made a solemn promise and will not take it back. You will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. What's that? Good News Bible. It's oh. very clear in the Old Testament that God designed the Israelite government to have separation of powers. We, that's an American term, I think, but it, it was there. God did the same thing. No king was ever to be a priest or to function as priest. We've seen some examples where they tried it and it didn't work out too well, did it? Cat got, they got leprosy or they died. And no priest was ever to be king. There was a further separation of powers when a prophet spoke out against both priest and king. So you could theoretically have three powers in opposition with each other, going at the same time. But when Jesus came, even though he was from the tribe of Judah, and which tribe was that? The tribe the of what? Of the kings. And thus he was not of the Levitical line. Instead, he was in the priestly order of Melchizedek, which, what does that mean? Well, what do we know about Melchizedek? He was from Genesis 14, king yeah. from he was a priest king. and a king. And he was not an Israelite. Not an Israelite. Way before Levi, so it couldn't be a descendant of Levi. Christ was not to be an earthly priest who would eventually die and end his ministry. He was to be a priest forever, to match his kingly rule forever. Furthermore, unlike the earthly priests who had to offer sacrifices for themselves before they could minister to the people, Jesus Christ was holy, faultless, sinless, and could offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of all men because he was a perfect sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews 10, 7, 20 through 28, if we had time, we would stop and read it. In other words, Jesus will become not only our Savior and priest, but also our eternal King. Ms. Myra? White says in Desire of Ages, page 24 and 25, it, by his humanity, Christ touched humanity. By his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of God. As the Son of Man, he gave us an example of obedience. As the Son of God, he gives us the power to obey. It was Christ who from the bush on the Mount Horeb spoke to Moses saying, 
I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3, 14. This was the pledge of Israel's deliverance. So when he came in the likeness of men, he declared himself that I am the child of Bethlehem, a, the meek, the lowly Savior, was God manifest in the flesh, 1 and Timothy 3.16. At Christmas season every year, we hopefully hear the song, Mary, Did You Know? Yes. Mm. And there it is. Yeah. Imagine holding that tiny baby, feed him at, feeding him at the breast, and saying, this is God Almighty. It's something I... I a mother cannot comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. Even less so a father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to us, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the living bread. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. John 10, 11, 6, 51, and 14, 6. Also, Matthew 28, 8. I am the assurance of every promise. I am not afraid. I am not. I am. Be not afraid. Yeah. You left that one key word in there. That's right. This study should raise some significant questions in your mind. One, how has God demonstrated his unwavering faithfulness to his covenant despite the people's unfaithfulness? Think of how many times God came back was faithful, etc., despite their rebellion. I mean, they, they tried every corruption you can pause and false religion, the fertility cult, I mean, just to the Old Testament. What reassurance does that bring to God's struggling children today? Two, how does, God, how does Christ's unique and superior priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek, strengthen the certainty of salvation for God's people? So, if he's king and Priest. 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 I mean, <laughs> yes, he, has, he has all the authority. He makes all the decisions. He has the ability to do it. I mean, you know. Three, the Gospels show that m many Messianic promises in the Psalms were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. How does this demonstrate the veracity of God's Word? Why must we resist any and every sentiment that tends to weaken our trust in God's Word? I mean, to see those... Uh, and. You could spend hours doing this, looking at the, pro the, the parallels in Psalm, even if you only call them parallels, in Psalms and the life of Christ. They are just unbelievable. What um, great consolation can we get from Christ's words, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. How do we apply this promise to our own experience? What are we supposed to be doing with this all-powerful stuff? Tell the world. That's what he told us to do. Clearly, it has been demonstrated in this study that Jesus Christ is the center of the entire biblical record. Jesus is portrayed as the Good Shepherd, the Suffering Messiah, the Son of David, the King Eternal, and the Heavenly Priest. That's kind of all comprehensive, isn't it? These ideas are clearly presented in Psalms and are perfectly reflected in the ministry of Jesus. It should be obvious that the writers in the psalm, of the Psalms, writing over a period of a thousand years, when was the first Psalm that we know about written? Moses. And about what, approximately when did he live? 1,400 years before Christ. And the last of the Psalms was written approximately when? Babylonian in captivity. Babylonian captivity, that would be 500 BC. So almost a thousand years from beginning to end just in the Psalms, okay? Said some amazing things about the future king. And let's just look at a... The, Jesus is the Yahweh, that, that's our, our God, of the Old Testament. He is God. And um, we obviously don't have time to look at these things, but um, there's a new, <clears throat> the prophecy in the Old Testament, sorry, and the New Testament application. Jesus should be worshiped, 
Psalm 97, 7, and he should be Hebrews 1, 6, because he is the Son of God. Jesus says God receives honors. Psalm 45 and Hebrews 1 again. Jesus is creator and is eternal. Psalm 1, and, and these are just, just one or, these are just, most of these have just one reference. There could be many support each one of these things. Again, Psalm 102 represented in Hebrews 1. Jesus is the Son of God. And if you know the Aramaic and the Hebrew, how they're constructed, <clears throat> when you say, you can't, there's not a way of saying a human being, you say a son of man. So if you say son of God, what are you saying? Divinity. Divin, he's divine. He is, he's divine. And there are lots of references for that. It's, um, it's amazing how much the Quran talks about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so many of these things you just read is there. We do not have the time I would share it with. Right? So it would be good for our pastors all over the world to yep. find this, you know, and because there's common grounds to share. You think that, them. you know, I, I, I recognize that. Um, I have something that's completely illegal at my house. I have a translation of the Quran. Yeah, I You're can. not supposed to read it in any language except Arabic. Arabic. And that's why, I mean, that's, you know, think of what the priests, the Catholic Church did with the, with our English Bible. They tried to preserve it. Only the priests would be allowed to read it. Well, we broke that chain with Martin Luther and William Tyndall and people like Jerome and people like that. But Muslim, Islam is still, you, you have to take it the way the Mullah tells you. That's right. No freedom there, is it? But many are reading it now, by the way. And uh, That's learning. That's good. And it's so easy to talk with them. Yeah. So easy to share the gospel. Human beings have never been able to fully comprehend the idea that Jesus could be fully human at the same time fully divine. How do we know that? Can you think about the history of the Christian church? What was this, the Nicene Council was all about? Well, that? that was one of the main ones. Several times they had councils. These councils would go on for months. Sometimes one, yes. one, one council went on for two or three years. I don't think they were there the whole time, but they would go and they'd, back and they'd come back. And, you know, some of them said, well, Jesus could be fully God, and then he just came and pretended to be a human being. And others said, Oh, no, Jesus couldn't be fully God. He was a human being, but God sort of adopted him into his family. I mean, back and forth they went. Anyway. I think in 1975, there was a Sabbath school quarterly. You mm -hmm. remember that one? Um, the book of Psalms mentions many aspects of the life and ministry of Jesus. These tables would suggest something that other scholars have said in the, as well. The Psalms was probably the most widely quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Many of the New Testament writers quoted it. As we know, the sufferings and crucifixion of Christ were a major theme, even back in the book of Psalms. Uh, these incredible parallels between the Old Testament and, uh, of the New Testament do not begin to mention all the other possible references in the Old Testament. For example, many references from the book of Isaiah. But of course, the crucifixion of Jesus is not the end of the story. And so what happens next? Jim? Jesus' ministry of atonement, or <clears throat> atonement is what I should have said, in heaven, is no less important than the, uh, well, atoning sacrifice. Would we say at oneing sacrifice? Yeah. It, or really, was it a, a sacrifice is for uh, something you offer the, the deity, a God? Let, let's use the term reconciling. Well, that, even that, but, 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 People were never in a state of conciliation, so they had to be brought into conciliation. Yeah, true. Um, he accomplished, excuse me, the sacrifice he accomplished on Mount Cal Calvary. Uh, Calvary, I'm sorry. Thus, it is no coincidence that among New Testament writers, Psalms 110 is the most quoted or alluded to passage from the Old Testament. Okay, let's halt, halt for just a second. Why do you think that is? That's a little bit of a difficult passage. we That's the one that says, today you are my son, basically. 
Um, and why would the New Testament scholars be, many of them, quoting that? The New Testament writers. Yeah, the New Testament writers, yeah, right, correct. Why would they be quoting that passage? It's a direct suggestion that Jesus Christ, the human Christ, uh, was a divine being. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, case in point, Psalm 110, 1 is used 17 times in the New Testament, and there's all the places mentioned. Obviously, we, we wouldn't begin to have time to read all of those. Um, let me pick one, Luke 20. Well, here, that's the, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right until I put your enemies under your feet. Okay. I was going to look at this one, Luke 20. For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. David called him Lord. How then can the Messiah be David's descendants? And... This was, a, this was a question just tied the Pharisees up in knots because in their thinking, you know, if, if you are descended of somebody else, there's no way you could be superior to that person. No way. If you're the son, you know, the adults and the, your ancestors are almost, almost like gods, you know. But very quickly, though, if Jesus came uh, in, in the big home somewhere, even though in the in the lineage of of David, I think some of them would give them give him second thought. Uh, this guy, no way, mm -hmm. kind of thing. If that makes sense, you know. I mean, he was Mister Nobody. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hebrews ten verse four is quoted a total of four times in different places. How many of these passages were used by Jesus in his explanation by the, to the two friends on the road to Emmaus? If there's this many passages that we have found just in this lesson, we've just scanned over so many of them, what do you suppose Jesus was doing on the road to Emmaus? Gave them a, the best uh, Bible lesson, history. I want to hear that yeah. story. I want, to, I want to hear Jesus tell those two men. I'm looking forward to that one. Let us summarize by talking about the different attributes of God which are mentioned in Psalms, which are appropriately applied to Jesus Christ in the New <coughs> Testament. Charles, I think that's yours. Is it? Okay, I'll read this one then. The heavenly ministry of Jesus, along with our understanding of his work on our behalf, is central to our daily spiritual experiences, experience as Christians. Hebrews states with confidence, this hope we have as an anchor of, our, of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6, 9, 19, and 20, where it quotes the end of Psalms 110, verse 4. Okay. And Couldn't all that paragraph be summed up as everything Yahweh, Jesus, had ever done is to bring everybody, all of his creation into a state of at one moment, a state of harmony. Those ones who are, will, those who are willing to, do, to, be get, to be brought into harmony. Well, yeah, you, well, you can't force them. There would yeah. be no harmony if, if yeah. his force is involved. Okay, and another table here, which obviously we don't have time to, to spend going through this, but Christ's incarnation and complete offering, Psalm 40, Hebrews 10, zeal for God's house shall consume Jesus, Psalm 69, John 2, Jesus shall open his mouth in a parable, Psalm 78, and Matthew 13 is a whole chapter full of parables. Jesus shall feed the people with the bread of heaven, Psalm 78, and John 6. I mean, just amazing. Jesus is the cornerstone, Psalm 118, 22. He read that passage, and of course, many places in the New Testament. And it, we, just, we, we just mentioned the ones in the Gospels. What about Ephesians? We read that already. Children share, shall praise Jesus' works in the temple, Psalm 8 and Matthew tw uh, 21. And then another, 
the whole section on Jesus' suffering, prophecy, uh, betrayed by his close associates, Psalm 41, John 13, we know about Judas. His enemies give him gall and vinegar to drink when he thirsts. Uh, Psalm 69 and Matthew 27. He is forsaken by God, Psalm 22 and Matthew 27, Mark 15. God is mocked, Psalm 22 and Matthew 27. His enemies shake their heads at him, Psalm 109, Matthew 27. They defy Jesus' faith. They divide his garments. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, all this stuff. Jesus becomes a reproach to his friends. Psalm 88 and Luke 23. Jesus utters his last words, Psalm 31. Luke 23, his bones are not broken, 34 and John 19. His body will not decay in the grave, Psalm 16 and Acts 2 and Acts 13. I mean, and that's not, now his exaltation to heaven. We don't even have time, we're running out of time. He's, it says he's going to sit at the right hand of God. Psalm 110, Matthew uh, 22. A descendant from the David will be on David's throne. Psalm 132, Acts 2. Jesus rules the nation. Psalm 2, Acts 4. Jesus is priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, Hebrews 5 and 6 and 7. Jesus led the captivity captive. Psalm 68 and Ephesians 4. Is that enough passages? <laughs> Jesus describes God's character. Many of those aspects of God's character are applied to Jesus by the writers of the New Testament. Attributes of God's character in the Psalms apply to Jesus in the New Testament, and we're just about running out of time. I think we can get this list done. The goodness of the Lord can be tasted or experienced personally. Jesus forgives sins. He is the life. He is the rock. He is righteous. And there's passages for every one of this. He is omnipresent. His kingdom is eternal. Um, he is the Son of Man, meaning that He is human and divine. His word, his word dwells in the, in the believer. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10 is a portrayal of the reception that Jesus receives and will receive when He returned, or, or did return and will return to heaven. Look at that. Fling wide the gates, open the ancient doors, and the great King will come in. Who is the great King? He is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord victorious in battle, and we better stop there. But just imagine the reception that Jesus received as he came back to heaven and the reception he will get when he comes with the, with the righteous at the time of the end. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a marvelous lesson about your way of trying to reach us through prophecy, through so many things that would just be completely impossible from just a human standpoint, proving and proving and proving your divinity. And yet you came and did all those incredible things to try to save us, to try to teach us this, these important lessons. May we learn them. May we live them. May others see you in us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.